Hi, I'm Phil Campbell, the minister here at Scots Church Melbourne, and I want to warmly welcome you to our website. Scots is known around the world for our beautiful building and our wonderful music, but I want to take a moment to remind you that we're fundamentally a community of people who are learning what it means to be 21st century followers of Jesus. Sunday by Sunday we gather, people of all ages and from diverse backgrounds. We're thankful for our Scottish heritage, but as Melbourne has grown as a multicultural city, that's reflected in our church family. We're a church where you'll hear the Bible taught in a way that makes sense. You'll be inspired by the soaring stained glass windows. You'll be stirred by the power of the Riga organ. And you'll be challenged to follow Jesus with us and to join in loving our city to life in his name. Enjoy browsing scotschurch.com. You're welcome to join us live on YouTube any Sunday, but better still, drop in at our 11am or 5pm services and say good day in person. We'd love to meet you. The Apostle Paul says, God has demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Please be seated. Friends, the gospel of the Lord Jesus is the message of life in his name. That's a gospel that moves us in all kinds of ways towards godly living, towards paying attention to his word, and moves us in other ways too, as described in the hymn we're about to sing now. It's called Moved by the Gospel. So let's join in singing it together.
please be seated. Now, a very warm welcome to you this morning. Thanks for joining us in person here at Scott's Church and online via YouTube streaming. Uh, If you are new to Scott's, please introduce yourself on the card that you'll find somewhere in your row. Uh, You can fill that in and drop it at the door or scan the QR code and uh, do it online. Also, uh, please do stay for morning tea after the service uh, on the mezzanine level in the Westpac building uh, or at the very least, grab a coffee as you leave in the foyer. Now, just a reminder, our Scott City Contemporary Service meets in the hall across the way at 5pm this afternoon. It is growing week by week. It's a delightful group and you're very welcome to join us. Now, I don't know if you remember it, but April Fool's Day 1984 was a Sunday. Louise and I had just welcomed our first child three months before. The US President was Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher was the English Prime Minister, and Bob Hawke was ours. Number one on the top 40 was Footloose by Kenny Loggins. Ghostbusters was playing at the movies. The internet hadn't yet been invented, but if you were the technical type, you might have had a Commodore 64 computer. Now, I don't know what you might remember about April 1st, 1984, but that's the day, 38 years and two days ago, that Douglas Lawrence took on the position of music director here at Scott's. And he remembers it quite well, uh, partly because he was told by someone that he wouldn't last six months. And here he is, still going strong, 38 years later, in two days. Uh, Douglas, I want to say thank you to you. In fact, we all do want to say thank you to you for the way you've used your gifts in serving and encouraging God's people. And we very much love what you do for us. And I think we might show that with a round of applause. And bells, thank you. Special events get bells. Now, on that note, during Easter week, Douglas is directing a series of exceptional lunchtime concerts. They'll be running at 1pm from Monday, April 11th through to Maundy Maundy Thursday. Then on Good Friday, a Good Friday service at 11 and a 7.30pm performance of Bach's St John Passion. We would love it if you would plan to be here and if you'd invite your friends along too, and especially to our Easter services on Good Friday and Easter Day. Just finally from me, our preacher this morning is Mike Rader, one of our favourites, who's helping out as I had a couple of uh, sick days during the week with a man cold. That definitely wasn't COVID, though Wendy wisely wouldn't let me come into the office, and uh, you might like to keep your distance from me today, but I'm well on the mend. But Mike, it's very kind of you to fill in and a great treat for us. We're going to sing again now. The hymn is, O Thou Who Camest From Above.
Please be seated and would you join with me in prayer? Let's pray. Our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who came from above to pour out your spirit on your people. As we've just sung together, we indeed pray that you would continue to kindle <clears throat> that flame of sacred love in each one of our hearts. That by your spirit, you would continue to transform our motives and our desires. That as your people, we would more and more long for justice, mercy and peace. That we would more and more give evidence of love and joy in our lives, of patience, kindness and gentleness. That over all these things we might put on self-control. Father, our prayer is that in all things, we, your people, might truly honour you, not only with our lips, but in our lives. Father, we confess this morning that so often when left to our own ways, the inclination of our hearts is to serve self rather than others, to glorify self rather than you. And for that, we continue to ask your forgiveness in Christ Jesus. As we look at our world, we see turmoil and suffering. We cry out for justice, that the guilty may not remain unpunished, that evil may not go unchallenged. With the prophet, we long for your day of reckoning, humbled and thankful that in Christ, you are prepared to pass over our every sin because of him. And so as we gather this morning, we do so to glorify you in song, to hear from your word, and to petition you in prayer, as we do now in the words taught to us by the Lord Jesus himself when he prayed, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Let us open our hearts to God in heaven and pray. Let us pray. God of faithfulness and truth, we praise and give you thanks for the depth of your love for us in Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, our Lord and Savior. Loving God, during this Lenten season, we thank you for drawing us together and opening our hearts. We gather in humility, reverence and, and hope of your healing love. Thank you for helping us discover new truths that can shape our lives, that you have always loved us and that we can be renewed in your life again and again. We thank you for everything this past week that has given us pleasure, nourishment, strength, and even challenges. Lord of Lent, inspire us this morning with your presence among us. Encourage us to grow in the ways of your kingdom. Enlighten us to walk in truth and love. And lead us to share the blessings we receive from you. Lord God, in this world where goodness and evil continue to clash, instill in us a deeper understanding of your mercy and grace and renew our love and devotion to you. Help us see what is right and believe what is right in your sight and give us the courage to do what pleases you. Remember your church, O oh Lord. Strengthen, bless, and protect your church in the world and this place that you would guard and guide your church by your spirit, that the body of Christ may be led into the way of truth for you are the God of truth in Christ Jesus. We pray to your generous goodness to all those who are in a way afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or circumstances. We remember that those who have COVID will recover quickly. We ask that you would protect those in frailer health. We thank you for bringing newcomers to your church in this place. And thank you for helping us to welcome them into our church family. We continue to pray that you would bless those traveling offices. May your travel mercy be upon them. Those who celebrate birthdays, wedding anniversaries, the birth of a child, and as well as the long service ministry in this place, that you would bless each and every one of them. And may they know that God re rejoices with them too. We pray for world peace. Prince of Peace, your people are waiting for you. We remember the suffering people in Ukraine, Afghanistan, Myanmar, and countries in crisis waiting for peace and reconciliation. Lord, the refugees are waiting for their beloved homeland. The soldiers are waiting for when the war will end. In Ukraine, the bereaved are waiting 
for their loved ones to be found and properly buried. In our country, the flood victims in New South Wales are waiting for the rain to stop and the flooding to recede. The sick and injured are waiting for healers. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have not forgotten us. You will never leave or forsake us. Guard your suffering people in us to find strength, courage, and peace in you. May whatever circumstances, fears, or anxieties your children have, whatever darkness lurks on the horizon, whatever is happening in the world around us, Lord, you are our strength and refuge, a very present help in trouble, our salvation. The sovereign Lord is our strength. In Jesus' precious name, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Let us now sing praise to the holiest in the height. The first reading is from the Old Testament, Habakkuk, chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear, or cry to your violence, and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and the justice never go forth. For the wicked sur surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Look among the nations and see wonder and be astounded. 
for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe it told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth and the earth to seize dwellings and not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. The horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence. All their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress. For they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep up like the wind and go on. Guilty men, whose own might is their God. Sorry about this. <laughs> the second reading is from Habakkuk, chapter 3, 16 to 19. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my house. Bones, my legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vine. The produce of the olives fail, and the fields yield no more. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. To the Coromaster, with stringed instruments.
The final reading this morning is from the New Testament, John 16, 16 to 24. Read <clears throat> a little while and you will see me no longer, and again a little while and you will see me. Some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he has said to us? A little while and you will see me, and again a little while and you will not see me because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves, what I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly I say to you, you will, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because of her, her time has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also, you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give to you. Until now you have asked nothing of my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Amen. Well, thank you, Phil. It's always a delight to be back with you at Scott's and to share God's Word. So let's pray as we turn to the marvelous little book of Habakkuk. Or if you're American, Habakkuk. Let's pray. Our Father, in these days there's much darkness in our world and maybe in our lives. So we pray this morning you will shine the light of your word into our world and our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last year, my wife Sarah did a podcast with a woman called Jenny Salt. Jenny uh, interviews people who have uh, stories to tell. And since Sarah was born and raised in Pakistan and went back there as a missionary wife and mother, Sarah has a story to tell. But in the podcast, she focused on one particular time in our life in Pakistan. It was about 1994, I think the first year of our second term of service. I was teaching in a Bible college. Sarah was raising a small family and working with the wives of the students. And we received a letter from a close friend back home. Judy was in our church, a passionate Christian, I think our church's keenest evangelist and our most faithful correspondent. But we've seen in the last two years of her letters a growing hostility towards the church and the Christian faith. And this was her last letter to us in which she said she was no longer a Christian and she could barely contain her joy. She quoted the words of Wesley's great hymn, My chains fell off, my heart is free. And she closed with the words, No doubt you are concerned for the state of my immortal soul, but let me assure you, I am not. Goodbye. Uh, both Sarah and I cried. But this letter didn't just upset Sarah, it disturbed her own faith in God. I mean, Judy was smart, a deep thinker, 
become a believer late in life. Sarah's faith, while genuine, was the faith given to her by her parents. And Sarah thought, well, Judy's smart. She's smarter than me. If she can't find the Christian faith reasonable, maybe I've been duped. I've been sucked in. At that point, a great cloud of doubt envelops Sarah. She tried to pray, but felt she was talking to a wall. When she opened the Bible, it raised more questions than it gave answers. It's called, in the Christian tradition, a dark night of the soul. I'm often asked, well, what were you doing, Mike, at the time? What were you saying? Well, what could I say? What did I say? She didn't know. She was a mature Christian, well-taught. She's a mystery for Pete's sake. What, what could I say or do? Just sit back, try to encourage her, pray that God would come through for her. Which he did about 18 months later. Now, I mention this not to focus on her experience of God back then, but Sarah's experience of God today. I don't know a woman with a more vibrant, intimate, personal faith in God than Sarah. Like Job, another man with doubts and questions, Sarah knows her Redeemer lives. And my point is, I think what she went through back then helped shape and form the vibrant believer she is today. Every day we turn on the news and watch terrible scenes of what's happening in Ukraine. More horror, more bloodshed. Just as we thought the floods were over, more rain falls in New South Wales. We wonder what. God doing in sending the rain because God does send the rain. He, Jesus said he sends the rain on the just and the unjust. Those things I think can perplex and disturb us. Two and a half thousand years ago was a man called Habakkuk who was disturbed by what God was doing, had doubts and questions and like for Sarah, God came through for Habakkuk. So I'll look at this, this book briefly and particularly the last few verses and see how he emerges as a stronger, more vibrant Christian. But first, a quick overview. Habakkuk in 60 seconds. It's 600 BC in Judah, a time of moral and spiritual chaos. There's immorality, idolatry, injustice. And these are God's people and they're killing each other. And Habakkuk says, God, how can you stand by and just do nothing? That's his problem. You just seem to be apathetic to suffering. Do something. So God says, I will. I will. I'll raise up the Babylonians to come and devastate the land. Now, it's a bit like a pastor in Ukraine some months ago, praying to God, God, this country, Ukraine, is a mess. Corruption everywhere, empty churches, people apathetic, immoral, do something. God says, I will. I will send the Russians to devastate the land. And the pastor would think, well, that's, that's not the wake-up call I had in mind, God, really. Your solution is worse than the problem. Do you know about the Russian army? They're, they're brutal. How can you do that? That's Habakkuk's first problem. God, your eyes are too pure to see evil. How can you use a people like this for your purposes? So God's second answer is, don't worry, Habakkuk, keep the faith, maintain your integrity. A day will come when both wicked Israel and the Babylonians will get their just desserts. On the day when the earth is filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. 
And the book ends with a prayer. Let's have a reminder himself and his people of times in the past, particularly the Exodus, when God saved his people and judged his enemies. So he says, I'll wait quietly for the day of trouble to come upon a people who invade us. And now in the last verses you see a transformed prophet from doubts and questions to faith and joy and confidence. I want to see just two things from these last verses. First, God makes the fig tree blossom. I think this has two implications. First, at times the fig tree won't blossom. The vines not yield food. The stores don't have animals. Businesses thrive. They go bust. Pandemics come, pandemics go. Nations rise, nations fall. Marriages thrive, marriages collapse. People get sick and die, get sick and recover. That's life in a world outside of Eden. Oh, it has been, oh, it will be, till God makes all things new. Sometimes the fig tree does not blossom. This isn't just the, the circle of life, the cycle of seasons with no purpose. No, that's the second important implication from these verses. Now, it's striking when Habakkuk decide, describes the events of life that worry him, he's speaking of his time, the events of his day. He doesn't say, if our army doesn't triumph, or the walls fall down. Though the Babylonians kill our men, women and children, and take us off into exile, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. But they're the things that are happening. He doesn't mention those. I mean, God sent the Babylonian army. I mean, sure, Nebuchadnezzar had his plans to build his kingdom, to have a buffer state between him and Egypt. There is plans. But he said, how about draws all his lessons from the world of nature and farming? The fig tree, the vine, the olive grove, animals, sheep, cattle, all under God's sovereign hand. We sing that famous old hymn, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, the Lord God made them all. Then it goes on, he sends the snow in winter, the warmth to swell the grain, the breezes and the sunshine, the soft refreshing rain. Now, it could just be saying God sends the weather. Spring, summer, hot, cold, but I think he means more than that. He's more specific. Today in Melbourne, it's 17 degrees and cloudy. God sent that. And I thank him for it. Let's give the hymn a flip side. Sometimes God does not send the snow in winter or the warmth to swell the grain. Sometimes the breezes are cyclones and he withholds the soft, refreshing rain, and droughts come. Sometimes the fig tree does not blossom. And that's Habakkuk's problem. How can you, God, how can you, God, send the Babylonians? And he thinks, differently from many Christians today, doesn't he? To suggest for all Putin's ambitions that God permitted the Russians to enter Ukraine. I mean, while we have no problem praying for God to end the war in Ukraine, can we believe in some sense 
He allowed the war in Ukraine to begin. While we pray for God to depose Putin, can we affirm he put him there in the first place? As the Bible teaches. So we affirm he's king of kings, he's sovereign lord, but we balk at his sovereignty. We know he works all things together for good in, your, in our lives, both pleasant and painful, but does he really plan and work all things for good? He may have the power to get my life out of the mess it's in, but can I believe he allowed that mess to take place in the first place? Now, the implication of Habakkuk's prayer is the fig tree would blossom. The vines be full of fruit, the stores full of cows and lambs, if the Lord had so planned. But here's the point. Whether blossom or no blossom, full or empty, I will praise the Lord. Or to quote again Job, who's a lot like Habakkuk. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. I will praise the name of the Lord. God sent a dark night into Sarah's life. God then shone a light into her darkness and made her the woman she is today. Second, the faithful trust and thank God even when the fig tree does not blossom. Now, let's, let's feel the force of this song. It seems like a bouncy song, doesn't it? Do you, those of you who are oldies like me, remember the 70s and a chorus? Remember that chorus? Though the fig tree does, you remember it? does not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vine, da 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 Very bouncy, very happy. Is, that, is this a bouncy song? What are you describing? No fruit, no fruit, no animals, no meat, no milk. He's describing famine, starvation, hunger, death. This is not a bouncy song. Yet, even in this situation, he can rejoice. He's almost upbeat. Why? Because he looks forward and looks back. Forward to a day when the fig tree will always blossom. The fields will be full of food. And looks back to a time when God came through for him and saved him and brought justice. Like Paul's great words in Romans 8, if God did not spare his son, but gave him up for us all, if he did that back then for us, how would he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? I've raised questions about God's sovereignty. Why Ukraine? What's God doing there? And the answer is, I don't know. I do know there are very few blossoming fig trees right now in Kiev. Very few animals in the stalls or flocks in the fields. But I know this. One day God will bring judgment on all the oppressors and the tyrants and he's working in Ukraine in his church for good for his people. A few years ago, I met a man called Johnny Gibson. He teaches now in a seminary in America. On March 17th at 10.25 a.m. in 2016, his daughter Layla was born. Johnny brought their son Ben to hospital to meet his little sister. 
Ben gave Layla a toy camel and held it in his arms. And Johnny said, as I watched him holding Layla, I noticed two things. One, she never opened her eyes. And two, she never made a sound. Layla was still born. On the way home in the car, little Ben asked his dad a question. He said, Daddy, will mummy ever grow a baby that wakes up? And Johnny said, I don't know. But let's pray that he will. Then Daddy why isn't Layla coming home with us? And Johnny said, because she's gone to be with Jesus. Why is she gone to be with Jesus? Because Jesus called her name, said Johnny. But will she come to be with us after she's been with Jesus in heaven, said Ben. Johnny said, no, Ben, because when you're with Jesus, you don't want to be anywhere else. And Ben asked, Daddy, did Layla not like us? And Johnny said, she does like us. She just likes Jesus more. And then Ben asked, Daddy, why isn't she coming home? And Johnny said, Ben, I don't know why. But then Johnny thought about the moon. That there are days when you can't see all of the moon. But we still know that the moon is round. That's a bit like God's goodness today. Sometimes you can't see all of God's goodness. But the Bible says God is good. God is always good all of the time. Though sometimes you can't see it. Just like the moon. The moon is always round. Though sometimes you just can't see it. So Johnny wrote a book for children. The moon is always round. There was a time when Habakkuk could not see it. When Sarah could not see it. I think right now in Ukraine, the church probably cannot see it. And maybe in your life right now, you cannot see it. But beloved, the moon is round. The moon is always round. So I will rejoice in the Lord. Let me pray. Father, we confess right now in our world we find it hard to see your goodness. We see the triumph of evil. We see a weather that seems to be out of control. But we thank you for your word and the reminder that you rule the nations of the world. You calm the storm and the sea. You are the God who's in control and the God who showed your love for us through the events you ordained that led to the death of Jesus and is rising again. Help us, we pray, in these dark days to see and rejoice in your everlasting goodness. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let's stand and sing.
Lord, all of being, throned afar. Friends, I'm sure we all thank Mike for those words of encouragement to us this morning, very timely words. I thank you all for joining us here at Scott's this morning. Now, maybe you've been coming for a while and you've never thought to stick around for morning tea. Why not make today the first? Uh, Leave by the door to my left and just follow the crowd over to the Westpac mezzanine floor and meet some of our Butte regulars who will be there. Now, the benediction taken from Hebrews chapter 13. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, equip us with everything good to do his will, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory now and forevermore. Amen.